Welcome to St. Matthew's United Methodist Church, where we are a family of faith reaching out to share the life-changing love and grace of Jesus Christ with you. I'm Brian, one of the associate pastors, and we are glad that you're worshiping with us today online. I would like to lift up that on our new website, stm-umc.org backslash live. You will find our video. You're obviously, you're watching it. But if not, if you haven't gone to that website yet, there is an online order of worship you can locate there as well. So I invite you to go to that online bulletin where it will have our order of worship and lyrics and everything to what we're doing today. But again, we are glad that you're worshiping with us. And I invite you to prepare your hearts, minds, body, and soul for our call to worship. Our hymn of praise will be hymn number 578, God of Love and God of Power. I invite you to sing with us verses 1, 2, and 4.
affirmation of faith today will be the Nicene Creed, which is number 880. I invite you to join along with me. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Today, uh, as we continue to worship our amazing God, you will notice on our altar that we have a rosebud. And that typically means we are celebrating a new life that's connected here to St. Matthew's United Methodist Church. So the rosebud is for baby Franklin Thomas Mapes, and he is the uh, grand, actually the child of, of uh, Kelly and Ross Mapes, the grandchild of Patty and Frank Bonner, um, Casey and Zach Farmer, the aunt and uncle, and James and Alexander Cousins. So it's a connected family here at St. Matthew's. So we celebrate the birth of Franklin today. So at this time, I would like to just invite all of you, wherever you are, worshiping with us this morning, to join me as we go to God in prayer. So let us pray. Gracious and loving God, today we lift up our thanks and praise for the arrival of Franklin Thomas Mapes. We pray that you will guide and support Ross and Kelly as they love and nurture their new son. May this home be filled with faith, joy, and love. And allow this congregation to be a true spiritual family for, as they call, little Frank. And today, Lord, as we gather together this morning, we worship you. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to enter into each and every space that we are, Lord. May we have our hearts and eyes opened by you so that we can hear your calling upon us in each in our lives. And today, Lord, there is an uncertainty all around us and so many people who need to hear our prayers. So, Lord, today we lift up those whose health is compromised by the coronavirus or any other health issues. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering from the economic impact of this virus. Lord, we pray for our teachers, our parents, and students as they make plans and prepare to return to school in less than one month. Lord, we, we pray for our health care workers, our central workers, frontline uh, front responders, and other public servants, Lord, who put themselves in harm's way for us, especially during this time. Lord, we pray for our leaders as they help to seek to manage this challenge and make important decisions. All of this, Lord, can seem very overwhelming, but you tell us over and over again to not be afraid. Show us, Lord, how we can trust you. Lord God, you understand us inside and out. You know our anxieties, fears, and doubts. So may your Holy Spirit calm us today and help us to be the best that we can be for a broken world. Lord, we lift up to you this morning all the people here at St. Matthew's United Methodist Church, all those who suffer and find themselves in any kind of trouble. Lord, we lift up all concerns of our local community and we continue to pray for our world, its peoples, and its leaders. Lord, we pray for the one and only earth you have given to our care, and for your church universal, 
for his members and his mission. And Lord, we grieve with those who have lost loved ones as they have joined the communion of the saints. But now, Father, as with the confidence of the children of God, we proclaim together the prayer that our Savior taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Again, welcome to St. Matthew's as we are worshiping online today. Uh, if you are not watching through our new website, if you connected through another way, I do want to lift up the new website. It is going to be stm-umc.org. And to access the worship information, you just go on there and backslash live, and you'll get to all the videos, online orders of worship, and ways to give electronically. So check out our new website uh, look at all the wonderful information we've put on there, and we hope you truly enjoy it and that it connects you to our community of faith uh, there in this time of worshiping remotely and, and at home. I do want to lift up that the previously scheduled uh, youth small group meetings that were going to happen at host homes over the next couple of weeks with Jason, our new uh, youth minister, have been postponed until the situation improves in our area with the coronavirus. And so I invite you to check our website and our communications on when those will resume in the future. And, and for any information going on with our church, I just invite you to continue to check our new website. And then of course, as we prepare ourselves to continue to worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings, I'd like to lift up that you can give online through the link on this worship website there, and you can do so, or you can continue to mail in your offerings to the church office. So at this time, I invite you to continue to worship our amazing God there in our offertory anthem.
Today's scripture passage from uh, the Old Testament is coming from the, the book of Psalms. And we're looking at Psalm 11. If you'll just listen to me as I read Psalm 11. In the Lord I take refuge. How can ye say to me, flee like a bird to the mountains? For look, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in the heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is the holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his gaze examines humankind. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked, and his soul hates the lover of violence. On the wicked he will rain coals of fire and sulfur. A scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous, he loves righteous deeds, and the upright shall behold his face. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our hymn of preparation is going to be hymn number 601, Thy Word. It is good to be with you this morning online. It's always a joy to be gathered together as the people of God in this place. So thank you for choosing to allow us to worship with you now. It is truly our joy. This morning our reading will come again from 1 John, from 1 John chapter 4 verses 1 through 12, where John writes these words to us. Beloved, do not believe in every spirit. Do not, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many pro- false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know that the Spirit of God. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming. It is now already in the world. Little children, you are from God. You have conquered them. For the one who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they do not, therefore for what they say is from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens, whoever knows God listens to us, and whoever is not from God does not listen to us. For this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. For whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world that we may live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The love, since God loved us so much, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives on us. This love is perfected in us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Tests are interesting things. I think back in my life on some of the 
biggest academic test that I have. And there, there, there's two classes I can think of in particular in my life where testing was a big deal. One of which was a class in seminary, um, United Methodist History and Doctrine. It's a class required for all um, United Methodists to take for ordination. Dr. Barry Bryant was our teacher, and he was probably my favorite teacher I've ever had. Well, one of my favorite teachers I've ever had. And Dr. Bryant was very Wesleyan. Like, he, he probably, he has forgotten more about John Wesley than most of us will ever know. So, um, Dr. Bryant really tried to pattern his class after how the early Methodists lived and breathed and existed. And part of that was in the way Wesley trusted in God's provenience and God's sovereignty and God's uh, providence. Wesley was a big believer in God's providence. So Wesley and the early Methodists would often cast lots for certain things. And casting lots in our context would be very much like rolling dice. So this is how Dr. Bryant would teach. He would, we'd have notebooks upon notebooks upon notebooks upon notebooks filled with information. Wesley sermons, Wesley's theology, the whole nine yards. We, we would have all of it there. And we would um, have been studying all semester. And we really, his class really only had two tests, a midterm and a, and a final. And he would have you, basically, he would give you the 12 answers that are on the test, 12 questions on the test. He said, okay, guys, here's your questions, all 12 of them. And we'd know them. And it would basically be everything we studied the entire semester. Like, basically, he should have just said, your test is all of your notes. Be ready to give them back to me. So we would study. And this is how we take the test. The day of the, day of the test would come in. He'd give us, some of you, you may remember those little blue notebooks you'd write in. He'd give us a blue notebook. We'd have three questions on the test. He would take a dice. He would roll it three times. And the numbers that came up were the questions of the test. So we had no clue going into the test. We knew it could be anything over the course of the semester, and we had to be prepared for any of it. And then we'd take the test, and we'd write till our hands hurt, and we would leave exhausted. So I remember that test in history and doctrine. The other test I remember was always my test for quantum mechanics at Mississippi College. In that, in that um, class, we had the scientific calculators that were basically were small computers that you could program in formulas for. And the teacher said, you can use on the test as much of your notes as you can program into your calculator. So we would spend the corresponding weeks getting ready for the test by just trying to type in, back in the olden days with these calculators, type in as much of our notes as we could, as we could possibly get in there and then take the test and then fail the test. Um, my final in quantum mechanics, and thankfully Dr. Major's graded on a curve, my final test in there, I made a 45 and that was a C. That's really all you need to know. And I've probably never been prouder of a grade in my entire life than making a 45 on that final and having it, having it uh, curved up to a C. I was quite proud of, of that. Tests are interesting, aren't they? Tests show us what we know. That's why we take tests or why we're supposed to take tests. is to prove our knowledge and to prove what we know. You take tests in schools to show what you know. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you just cram the last minute to get it in there and, you know, you cram it and then you usually forget it and you move on. That's a lot of life, isn't it? You take the test, you cram for it, and then you move on. Some, some, some tests stick with you though, um, like the ones for Dr. Bryant and Dr. Majors. But th that information, well, the Wesley stuff stuck with me, but uh, not so much for quantum mechanics. In high school, our senior English teacher had us memorize the Canterbury Tales and do all of that stuff that you do in English. And uh, I don't remember much of it, but I do remember one that approved with this shower suit, the droughts of March that pierced it to the root and by the divine and switched to the core. You know, I remember half the Canterbury Tales. I don't remember which half, I just remember them. They're stuck up here. Now I can't tell you what I have for breakfast this morning, but I can tell you about the Canterbury Tales in 1994 in Bogachita. Tests are interesting. We see in the text today a notion of testing. John says, he starts off by saying, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see if they are from God. Test the spirits. That sounds difficult. 
One of the things in life I, I try to test, test the spirits to see if they're true or not. One of the, the lessons I've tried to learn in life is this. I try to take, you know, who, who amongst us likes to be criticized? <laughs> who amongst us like to be corrected? I know I don't. I'm always right. Just ask me, I'll tell you. But I've tried to learn in life the discipline to when faced with correction or criticism, not just ignore it, but to take it and hold it up to the light and see what's valid there. Is there anything that I can learn from this? We're told today in this passage to test the spirits. Well, how do we test them? How do, how do we test these spirits that we're told to test? I had, a, I had a, a friend who worked in the bank for a long time, and they talked about how they had to always take the dollar bills and hold it up to the light and look for that little, uh, little strip there to make sure it wasn't a counterfeit. I take criticisms and I hold it up to the light to see what's there I can learn. The way we test the spirits is we also hold it up to the light. But the light that we're holding it up to isn't an actual halogen or LED light, but the light that we hold the spirits up to is that light of Jesus Christ. Because we're told here in the text, it says, it says, it says that we're to test every spirit, but verse, verse 2 says, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. He, he is the light that we, owe, what we hold all things up to and test them by. There's a, there's a great uh, song by my favorite musician, Rich Mullins, entitled Hard. Um, it goes, well, I am a good Midwestern boy. I'd give an honest day's work if I can get it. I don't cheat on my taxes. I don't cheat on my girl. I got values that would make the White House jealous. When I do get a little bunch overimpressed, I think of Peter and Paul and the apostles. I don't stack up too well against them, I guess, but by the standards drawn here, I ain't doing that awful. You know, it's hard to be a man of peace. It's hard to bless another that's cursed you. It's hard to turn the other cheek. Lord, it's hard. It's hard to be like Jesus. Jesus is the light that we hold these spirits up to. Jesus is the light that we test all things by. Jesus is the light of the world by which we test all things. Does it glorify Jesus? Does it point others to him? Is it an example of his love? An example of his mercy? An example of his grace? An example of his goodness? Does this spirit, does this temptation, does this thought? Because see, here's the thing, y'all. Not all spirits are good. Not all thoughts are good. Not all impulses are good. Not all emotions are good. Not all things are good, y'all. There are things that are wrong. There are thoughts that we think that are not truth. I know I deal with that a lot. There are emotions that we feel that are not good, that are not of God. I know I deal with that a lot. We all have different things that come into our heads and come into our hearts and come into our lives. That may even feel good. They may feel righteous. They may feel holy. They may feel great. But the scripture says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see where they come from. Well, what is the test that we test them by? Jesus. Jesus. That thought that you think, does it glorify Jesus? Does it point others to Jesus? Does it direct your life to Jesus? That emotion that you feel, does it glorify Jesus? Does it point others to Jesus? Does it direct your heart to Jesus? Test the spirits. Test the spirits. 
I don't know if you are joining us on Wednesday nights on our website and on Facebook Live for our Wednesday night Bible studies. But if you are, last week was an interesting, I don't know, it was an interesting study to me because we're looking through James. I, I love James. James is just such a good book of the Bible. So interesting. Um, it personally calls me out a lot. I can feel real holy and proper till I really read James and I realize I got a long ways to go before I'm sanctified. But the thing that stuck with me is in this week we're reading in chapter two where he talks about keeping the law. And he says, you know that if you have transgressed in one area of the law, then you have transgressed in all the law. So if you say, don't commit murder, great. But then you commit adultery, well, then you violated all the law. So his point is, we can't just fixate, if we're going to hold to the law, we can't just fixate on the parts of the law that we get right. Because I'm good, man, I love to fixate where I'm right. I can, I can plow that ground all day long. But he says this, he says, he says, if you violate one part of the law, you violated all the law. And do we strive to keep the highest ideal of the law, what he calls the royal law, which is to love God? And love your neighbor. Do we keep that part of the law? What if? I mean, think about how legalistic we are in life. At least I am. It's, it's funny. We, me and Holly were talking about this one day. Um, I don't know. Me and my friend John Burning were talking about this one day. How a lot of times the way we were raised in our, our in, in maybe not even what we were taught. But what we internalize at a young age forms us. And I don't know that I was ever, I, in fact, I know that I was not verbally taught to be, a, to be a Pharisee. But somehow in my early faith, I became one. Became very legalistic. And it's silly ways that plays out. Like I said, I was never taught this. Bill Poole was my preacher growing up for most of my childhood. You know, Brother Bill didn't teach me anything stupid. So, but somehow I picked it up. That Christians aren't supposed to gamble. So Christians aren't supposed to play cards. Now, I was never taught down and told, Andy, don't play cards. Don't play cards. But guess what? Somewhere along the line, I learned you shouldn't play cards. So I don't know any card games. Folks say, want to play spades? I'm like, I don't know how to play it. I want to play bridge. I don't know how to play it. Like, I just, at an early age, internalized, don't play cards. I don't think that's the point of the law. I really don't think that's what Moses is talking about or what Jesus is talking about. If we're not careful, we can slide into real legalism or real, fair, or real, or, or, or real fair, Phariseeism. At least I can. The Ten Commandments are... Uh, much like our creeds. It's a simple way to teach us the essentials of the faith, the essentials, the essentials of our moral code. But if you take the Ten Commandments and distill them down, you're going to come out with loving your neighbor, loving your God and loving your neighbor. Because if you love God, you're going to keep his name holy. If you love God, you're going to honor the Sabbath. If you love God, you're going to worship no gods before him. You're going to have no idols. Well, if you love your neighbor, you're not going to murder your neighbor. You're not going to commit adultery with your neighbor. You're not going to covet your neighbor's possessions. You're not, going to, you're not going to give false witness to your neighbor. I mean, so loving our God and loving our neighbor really is the distillation of the Ten Commandments. And that's why James calls it the royal law. And that is the teachings that Jesus teaches us about here in the end here. And I think that's so important. Because if you think somebody's doing wrong, yelling at them's not going to change them. Just going to embitter them. Judging them probably not going to change them. Just going to embitter them, make them dig their heels in worse. But loving them might. Not not condoning. Not condoning sinful actions. Not condoning things that violate the teachings of Scripture. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. 
But I'm saying looking past the action and seeing the person for whom Christ died beneath it. Because we're told to love folks, and I want to love folks into heaven. I do. I want to love them into heaven. That's what Jesus tells us to do. So I have to love them for their sake. Because how else will they know the good news of Jesus? And I don't want to create enemies. I want to create brothers and sisters in Christ. I love them. And likewise, loving them releases me from my pain and my anguish. Because if I embitter my heart against people, then I just embitter my heart and I've blocked myself off from God's grace in many ways. So loving them as Jesus, as John tells us to here today, it gives them a pathway forward to freedom. And it gives us a pathway forward to freedom. And if the Son has set you free, then you are free indeed, is what, free indeed is what the Scriptures tell us. So we hold these spirits up to the light and say, does this spirit glorify Christ? Does this spirit make me holy? Does this spirit push me towards God's holiness? Does this spirit push me towards loving my God and loving my neighbor with all that I am? Does this spirit push me? Does this emotion push me? Does this thought push me towards glorifying God and loving Christ? Does this emotion, this spirit, this thought, this feeling, this gut, just because I think it doesn't mean it's from God. Just because I feel it doesn't mean it's from God. Just because it rushes through my head does not mean it's from God. Take these things up. Hold them to the light of Christ and say, does this emotion, spirit, thought glorify Christ? Does this emotion, spirit, thought cause me to obey his word better? Does this cause me to be a better pastor or Christian or husband or father or friend? And if it doesn't, that it's not from God. We submit, must submit all these things to God. We see today what it tells us. Little children, this is verse 4. Little children, you are from God and have already conquered them. For the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Sometimes our tests show us what we don't know. <laughs> if I ever had any, any misgivings of being a world-class chemist, quantum mechanics took care of that for me real quick. Sometimes I fail the test. And then I'm thankful for what we're told there. We've already defeated the world and defeated the spirits because we're not doing it. But Jesus is doing it. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Not greater is me. Greater is he who is in us. For he has already won the battle. I know I'm not going to speak for you, for the choir or Tim or Brian or anybody or Jamie. But I've been about, about the end of my rope the last few weeks. You just see the division, the death, the discord. As a pastor, you push, and you think, are you pushing for the right reasons, or are your pushing even working? And it's real easy to get discouraged. Real easy. Real easy. But then I remember. Greater is in who, he who's in me than he who's in the world. So when I get discouraged, I'm going to cling to Jesus. When I get frustrated, I'm going to cling to Jesus. When I get defeated, I'm going to cling to Jesus. When I feel like giving up, I'm going to cling to Jesus. When I get angry, I'm going to cling to Jesus. When I get happy, I'm going to cling to Jesus. In the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. And when I come to die, Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. 
but give me Jesus. We must submit the spirits to him. We must submit the emotions we feel towards him. We must submit our thoughts to him. For he has overcome the world. And see, that's the thing about the test we face, y'all. These tests we face, guess what? They're an open book test. You got your book right here in front of you. It's an open book test. You got all the notes you need. Boy, I love to get open. Uh, I love to get open no, open book test. I love that open notebook test. My only problem was my handwriting was so bad I couldn't read my notes. So I had to borrow Holly's notes half the time. But the test we face in life, y'all, it's an open book test. We got it right here. We just got to open it up. Greater is he who's in us than he who is in the world. May we test the spirits. May we test the emotions. May we test the thoughts. May we test it all. May we hold it up to his light. And may we do all things in life to glorify our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for your love, for your grace, for your power, for all that you are, God. We love you. You're good. Your mercy endures forever. May we live out your grace and your love each day of our lives. We ask it now in Jesus' sweet and holy name. Amen. This morning, as our service comes to a conclusion, we now come to our song of, our song of commitment. Perhaps right now, you've never made the decision to put all of your life. Maybe you've never submitted not just the spirits in your life. Maybe you've never submitted your life to Jesus Christ. Today's a great day to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. All you have to do is turn to him. We lift high the cross, and when all who look upon Jesus will be saved. So if you've never made that decision to place your whole faith in Jesus Christ, today is the day to do it. Perhaps you'd like to learn more about joining our church. Uh, I look forward to worshiping with you in person again soon. And I'd love to have you join our church when we come back together very soon. Today's a great day to make that decision. Perhaps you need to, we, you need to pray, we need to pray for you. If there's something we need to pray for, if you're watching this on the website, you can click on who we are and under staff and email any of the staff. Perhaps if you're watching on Facebook, message me on Facebook or any of our staff. We'd love to pray with you. But this morning, no matter where you find yourself, Jesus Christ here stands ready to meet you. Why don't you pray with us?
we prepare now to go out into the world from the spaces that we are in now, may the Lord God grant us that what we have said with our lips will believe in our hearts, and what we believe in our hearts when we live out in our daily lives. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.